Thank you, Silvana, and thank you everyone today for joining us on this call as we release our newest report, Working Hard Left Behind, Education as a Pathway from Poverty to Prosperity for Working Californians. Um, we're excited to be working on this project um, as the state partner for the National Working Poor Families, a national effort focused on working adults in the United States and how to ensure their opportunity to better skill themselves for the workforce as well as access post-secondary education. Um, as a partner, we were able to uh, use demographic data provided by the Working Poor Families Project um, based on U.S. Census data available and the Population Reference Bureau survey. We're going to be sharing essentially the findings on conditions of working poor families in California uh, with you. And I also would like to really thank the Women's Foundation of California uh, who are joining us in co-releasing this report today in our state. Um, if you have any questions, you'll have an opportunity to do it both via chat and by um, calling in. So uh, we look forward to having a conversation with you. I think many of you are familiar with the Campaign for College Opportunity and what we do, but for those who might be new to our work, we're a statewide nonprofit organization. We're a coalition of business, community, and civil rights leaders from across California that came together in 2003 really to avert what we see as a crisis in higher education where we have many young adults and older adults that are seeking opportunities to better their lives um, but find that the state and our colleges and universities uh, aren't providing sufficient resources and support to see them in and through college. Our mission is to significantly increase the number of students that go to college in California and actually complete college in California. And as part of that, we release major reports like this one to uh, highlight some important data and statistics facing our state. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest takeaways that uh, I hope you all leave as we review this report is that I think we all value this idea that California is really a land of opportunity, that if you work hard, um, you're going to have prosperity, you're going to have um, the opportunity to improve your station in life. And I think what the findings in this report actually reveal is that the notion that strong work ethic will help Californians move up the economic ladder is far from reality for, for too many, too many families. Um, while there's definitely great opportunity and wealth in, in the Golden State, this success has not reached everyone, and the California dream is really in severe danger of slipping away. Um, as I've said to many folks, on the one hand, we have millions of hardworking low-income adults who have limited chances of upward mobility because they don't have uh, better education. And on the other hand, we have thousands of companies that are seeking well-skilled and high-trained workers. So I think our job is to figure out how to close that gap. Um, as we reviewed this report, we found that California has the highest number of low-income families in the nation. In fact, one in three of working families are considered low-income. And I just wanted to highlight that this report in particular just doesn't look at all low-income families. It's focused in on those that are working and still low-income. And just so you know, um, I'm going to go back to that slide because I wanted to highlight that the definition of low income that we used is based on um, a threshold of $45,397 for a family of four. And that's double the poverty threshold um, that the federal government uses. So that's the marker when we're talking about low income families, we're, we're talking about families that fit that description. So. Uh, we have 3.2 million children in California that um, are in working low-income families. That's 40% of all the children under the age of 18. They live in families that are low-income. And what the study really confirmed is something that you know, many of us suspected, which is that there's very low educational attainment in low-income families. So while families are working hard, um, very few have any formal education. In fact, California low-income families are the least educated across the nation. And you can see some comparisons in the slide before you. But you know, when half of our low-income families have uh, at least one parent that doesn't have a high school degree or GED, you know that you're looking at very um, low levels of educational attainment amongst our families. And you know, 60% 
uh, have no, both parents without any kind of post-secondary education, and that's not having to complete one, but just having taken any courses in higher education, so pretty significant. And, you know, in fact, it's kind of highlighted by other research that has, you know, continued to say that California is becoming less educated than other states. When you look at our oldest population, those that are 65 and older, the baby boomers, they were some of the best educated in the country, you know, in terms of bachelor degree and associate degree attainment. And as you look down that chart on the left-hand side, you can see that our population of 25 to 34-year-olds are, you know, in the middle of the pack, 28th and 25th, respectively, in terms of associate degree or bachelor degree attainment compared to other states. And in California, what's particularly disturbing is that if you look at all adults, there's a huge college achievement gap that uh, is portrayed in this slide by race. And what we try to show you here in these circles is the percentage of the population as a whole and how many in that population have some you know, college education. And so you can see that of adults 18 to 64, 40% of the California population is non-Hispanic white, and 40%, 47% of those that are non-Hispanic white have some higher education um, attainment. When you look at Latinos, which make up 36% of the population, only 14% of Latinos in our state have a college uh, education, and this is an associate degree or higher. Um, so this is really troubling because we all know that the demographics of our state are, are changing, and yet there is a huge college achievement gap with regards to race. We also released a study a year ago that looked at the economic payoff, both personally and for the state of California in terms of those that do go on to college. And we find, and this chart shows you, that those with a college education spend fewer and fewer years in poverty, so directly related to all of the people that we care about. When you see um, those uh, statistics, it's really troubling. You see that if you have a bachelor's degree or more for all ethnic groups, white, black, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders and Latinos, they spend significantly fewer years in poverty. And we also know that there's a huge economic payoff um, for them personally. Those that do get a college degree earn 1.3 million in California, more than their peers that only have a high school diploma. And there's also this payoff for the state of California, where for every dollar our state invests in higher education, there's actually a $4.50 return on investment because folks that earn more, pay more taxes, uh, spend less, uh, we spend less as a state on them in terms of social services, and so there's a huge return on investment, all making for a, a strong case to really ensure that our state funding is adequately aligned to support um, higher education opportunities for Californians. I also want to address, because often we hear given the recession and the slow economic recovery we've experienced across the country and certainly in our own state, that you know everybody knows somebody that has a college degree and doesn't have a job. But in fact, there's been studies that look at, you know even during this recovery, this slow recovery, if you look at the recession on the far left, you see that over 5.5 million jobs were lost. And primarily, those that lost jobs were those that had a high school or less education. Um, there were definitely a lot of people with a bachelor's or some college, um, actually with some college that lost a job, almost 2 million of them. Um, but those that had a bachelor's degree or better, even during the recession from 2007 to 2010, 187,000 new jobs were had by those folks. And as you look at the last few years, the latest data that we found from January 2010 to February 2012, which is kind of considered um, a snapshot of the recovery, you see that of jobs gained, you know, over 2 million were, went to those with a bachelor's degree, 1.5 million to those with some college or an associate degree, and those with a high school diploma or less, they continue to lose jobs. Um, and so we know that, you know, the demand for educated workers is still there, and those that don't have a higher education are still losing out significantly. And some of the statistics on the right-hand side actually show you the growth in jobs um, that is projected. Many studies have highlighted that we'll need a million 
college graduates by 2025. That's from the Public Policy Institute of California. And when you add in those with an associate degree or certificate or other training mostly found at the community colleges, that number grows to 2.3 million in 12 short years, um, which we are not on track to produce. In the report, we looked at several of the pathways for adults. These are working adult families, so we looked at um, what we are calling non-traditional, but in many ways is kind of the new normal for California. These are folks that are working. They can't afford not to work. And so what are their pathways to get a better education? And adult education is core to that. This chart really shows you some of the state and federal spending that goes to um, adult education in California. We spend $2.1 in adult education. Um, and the next highlight here is really just to point out, um, you know, the feds require that when we provide adult education, we survey students and we get data on students that um, tell us whether or not they see higher education as a goal. And what we found is that, you know, only 2% of the adult education population that are served by federal funds cite higher education or training as a primary or secondary goal. So we can infer that many of them see adult education maybe as a goal to improve their English skills or get other skills, um, but not necessarily higher education or training. And so I think that's um, a big gap that we have to address. Um, and then there's the challenge around um, community college uh, access and completion. And so we wanted to share, you know, for many adults, the only pathway to higher education is the community college system. We have 112 in California. They serve over 2 million students per year. Um, and there are so many challenges with getting to college completion for students in that system. And obviously with the very devastating cuts to higher education over the past few years, we've had some major cuts to even being able to access courses in our system. But there's uh, a few statistics that we wanted to share about how many students are coming in um, underprepared for college level work, 85% unprepared for college level math. 70% are being assessed as unprepared for college level English. And we see that indeed, you know, only one out of five of these students that come in unprepared actually complete any kind of certificate or workforce training within six years. So we know that in order to improve um, the pathway of opportunity for adults at the community college, we must address remediation and basic skills and improve um, these you know, these statistics uh, to ensure greater completion from them. We also in the report highlight federal funding because there are several, you know, types of federal funding that target um, this type, of, you know, this population in need. And in particular, uh, temporary assistance for needy families in our state has been redirected significantly to Cal grants, which are scholarships uh, given by the state of California for students to go on to college. And so um, in the last year's budget, um, more than $800 million of TANF funds were redirected to cover the cost of Cal grants. And in the 2013, the current proposed budget, we see that almost uh, a billion of TANF funds will go to the Cal grant program. And, you know, we wanted to highlight this because uh, I, I think a, a concern is that, you know, while these Cal grants are certainly going to needy students, um, we find that few non-traditional students, such as adult learners or those from working low-income families um, that are adults and already in the workforce are really benefiting from this. And we wanted to show you a quick example. So this is a picture of a student just graduated from high school, has been accepted into the CSU has a 3.4 GPA, she's guaranteed these following entitlement grants. These are, you know, the five here are some options in terms of Cal grant funding. If she attends the CSU, she can get up to 5970 to cover tuition um, and a Cal grant B award the first year $1,473. Um, and you can see the size of the award for the student. This is a student that completed an associate degree uh, for transfer at community college, is preparing to go to the UC. 
uh, older student, she's guaranteed to receive the Cal Grant Entitlement Award as well. This is what that award looks like um, at the very bottom, about 13000 for a CS, uh, UC student in this case. And this is an example of what a working adult might actually be able to, um, to receive. This is a man who's 42, qualifies as low income, has family. Um, he's eligible to complete for only one of these awards, not eligible for the Entitlement Award. Um, and the Cal Grant B Competitive Award is a small award. It's $1,473 for each year at the community college. And what's really concerning is that there are a lot of eligible students for this Cal Grant Award. And based on a study from TECAS, the Institute for College Access and Success, last year only one in 17 applicants received the Cal Grant B Award. So you can see how the odds are stacked against a working low-income adult. In addition, we're very concerned that uh, a lot of federal financial aid through the Pell Grant is left on the table. In looking at 2009-2010 stats, we've found that about $500 million in Pell Grants um, went unclaimed because only one-third of community college students applied. And this has to do with the fact that many community college students fill out the Board of Governor fee waivers, they get their fees waived, but they don't complete the FAFSA, the Federal Financial Aid Form, and therefore don't access federal aid that they otherwise would be eligible for. We also know that as we looked at this report and pathways to opportunity for low-income families to go on to higher ed, that student supports matter. Do they receive orientation and counseling and advising, especially if they're working full-time, they're low-income, maybe they don't have anybody in their family that's ever gone to college, and we find that those support services are really critical, especially for this population that's got less you know, social capital to really navigate you know, higher education in our state. Students who lack that we know drop out, um, don't ever reach their goal, maybe take on a necessary debt, um, or just give up. We also looked at child care because when you're looking at working families and working adults, we know that child care matters in terms of their opportunity to go to college or not to get access to um, higher education. And you can see in this chart how state subsidized child care for this population has decreased dramatically. In our state, in fact, over 187,000 eligible children were on waiting list. And I think just as a comparison, 29 other states, in spite of, I think, the recession you know, hitting everybody, um, actually had enough child care to not need a waiting list. So those are a few of the highlights, but you know, I think any of you that know the Campaign for College Opportunities, we like to talk about some of the issues and the concerns and the statistics, but we're mostly interested in solutions and how to move forward. And so we wanted to present you a few recommendations for consideration and also for further discussion. I think as we looked at the data, we found that uh, foremost we needed to improve you know, coordination and pathways uh, between high schools, adult ed, and two-year and four-year colleges. Um, and this gets to the concern around remediation that was raised earlier, but also around adult education, students really you know, having higher education or workforce skills as a goal. We need a strategy around um, basic skills and remedial education when you see that only one in five students actually um, ever you know, complete uh, post-secondary education. If they start in remedial courses, that's not good enough. We need to do something about that. We definitely need a, a robust statewide data system. You know, some of the data we analyzed was you know, unavailable in terms of adult students. We couldn't tell what the state-funded um, adult students might have as a goal because we don't keep um, data on that. That's just one example of some gaps that exist. And we need a public agenda for higher education. Our state really needs to figure out how do we close that 2.3 million gap that we mentioned earlier? How do we have a clearly articulated vision for how many students go to college and graduate from college? Um, and that's absolutely necessary in our state. And we need to improve and expand financial aid options for non-traditional students. So we have a strong and powerful Cal Grant system that gives low-income students the opportunity to go to college, um, but we do not enough for those that are non-traditional, older working adults, 
Um, so what can we do to expand their opportunity to get aid and be supported as they improve their skills? And we need to prioritize educational resources that support student success. Um, so we talked about the orientation and counseling and clear guidance for students that need it. We really need to do a lot more to ensure that. And there's a lot of community colleges that are going in that direction and have done significant uh, work in this area because of the Student Success Task Force recommendations that have been put in place over the last year. Um, and so really ensuring that those are adequately funded and supported is key. And you know, before I turn it over to two uh, of our guest speakers, I just wanted to share what you can do. Because I think you probably are all interested in the data and the facts, but probably want to know what else can you do. And I think right now there's an exciting opportunity with Governor Brown outlining some goals for colleges and universities. In particular, there's some measures for performance to improve college uh, completion, improve the number of students that transfer to the UC and the CSU that are being discussed in the Capitol, and we need to support efforts to ensure that that plan makes sense and that it does indeed provide an outline for greater college um, success in our state. Two, you can promote this report using Twitter, Facebook, social media, share the report. Um, you can write to your newspaper a letter to the editor, an op-ed. Um, most importantly, engage, talk to your local legislator, your representative. As they make policy in Sacramento, they need to hear from you in terms of um, how you think they should be addressing this gap of the need for skilled workers and the demand by people to get those skills. Uh, and you can, if you're interested, host us at a regional briefing, um, invite us to give a presentation on these findings. And if you aren't already signed up for our newsletters and action alerts, as we push forward for policy reforms in Sacramento, we certainly invite you to join us for that. Um, but I'm really honored to have Judy Patrick, President and CEO of the Women's Foundation and also a partner with us on this report, um, here to say a few words about the impact of this report and a lot of the work that they've done on women's uh, issues in California and poverty in particular. So Judy, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I uh, have s uh, said several times uh, to uh, the people working on this report how critical, uh, critically important I think this report is for California. I have now read it several times. And uh, I am so eager uh, to promote the findings of this report because I think that it contains exactly the messages uh, that we need to be uh, giving in California at this critical time. We partnered uh, for many reasons uh, uh, in uh, the creation of this report, but mainly because we care deeply about California. And we care, uh, like the campaign, about uh, low-income families. And we believe that investing in education is crucial for California at this time. We know that if California does well, uh, women uh, and low-income families also will do better. We also know, and we've known this for years, that education beyond high school is the best predictor of not living in poverty, particularly for women. This uh, research that's being released today complements a report that we recently released in partnership with the California Budget Project entitled, A Fair Chance, Why, Why California Should Invest in Economic Opportunity for Women and Their Families. This report revealed that uh, the poverty levels for uh, all Californians have increased, as Michelle has said, but it has particularly increased uh, amongst families headed by women. Education sits at the core of uh, the, these poverty data. Another finding that uh, correlates well uh, with the findings from this report is that the only Californians since the recession who are not losing wages are those with bachelor's degrees. And as the number uh, of Californians with bachelor's degrees has declined, this has serious uh, impact on overall earnings, the tax base in California, on, on many things that are important to the future of this state. One of the findings uh, from uh, 
the research that we released earlier, the Fair Chance Report, is that uh, the number of women in education at every level in the state has declined. So since 2007, women's enrollment in state uh, universities has decreased while men's has increased. Also, the enrollment of um, women in the University of California system has increased more slowly than that of men. And finally, and probably most importantly, uh, and related to this report, is uh, that the overall enrollment uh, in, community college, uh, in the community college system, a place where low-income people often begin their post-high school education, has declined by a 600,000 people, two-thirds of those are women. There are various reasons for that. This report speaks to one of those, which is that we have such a, a decline in resources for child care. The state of California, since the recession, has lost uh, two-thirds of the funding that we had for child care for low-income families. This has had a, an impact on women's ability to get higher education. I am particularly concerned uh, that as California has gotten increasingly diverse, we've seen a dramatic increase in prison spending and a dramatic decrease in education spending. While diversity can be such a strength in the global economy, I feel that California is squandering this opportunity by failing to invest uh, in an education system that works for all. I think the findings and the recommendation in this report really would lead us towards an education system in California that works for all. So I speak today in deep gratitude uh, to the campaign for having produced this report. We will use it in much of our work. Thank you, Judy, and thanks for everything that you do at the Women's Foundation to move this work forward. I'm also really excited to be joined by Alicia Burhau, who's the Vice President of Workforce Development and Advocacy at the Orange County Business Council. She's also a member of the Real Coalition, which is a statewide network of leading business and um, business associations and chambers in California. Um, Alicia, thanks for joining us. I know you're really active in this space, and we'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Um, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Alicia Burhau with the Orange County Business Council. And just a little background on OCBC and the Real Coalition. Um, the Business Council, we represent about 250 of the largest businesses uh, in and around Orange County. Uh, that includes 250,000 employees uh, in the county as well as 2 million worldwide. Uh, being a part of the Real Coalition, which is uh, short for Regional Economic Association Leadership, which is a coalition of about 20 large business chambers and regional economic organizations that Michelle pointed out. Uh, we focus on education infrastructure issues led by my boss, Lucy Dunn of OCBC and Carl Gardino of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Uh, between OCBC and the Real Coalition, the business industry faces several challenges, uh, the biggest one being our skills gap. Uh, just for example, AT&T alone is looking to hire 3,000 people in the state, 1,000 of those in Southern California, and yet they're having a hard time uh, finding uh, em uh, potential employees uh, that have technical skills needed for those jobs. Businesses are looking for employees that they can eventually promote into managerial positions, but they're finding those potential workers uh, lack leadership skills. An example of that um, is looking for employees that are, are a little more outgoing and extroverted. The Boeing Company also is looking for employees with arts backgrounds uh, because it brings out more creativity and innovation in their jobs. Workforce housing is another problem that we're facing with the skills gap. As Michelle pointed out earlier, um, with our 24 to 34 year olds, they're leaving California because it's too expensive to live here and our businesses need more homegrown workers to enter into those jobs locally because they can better understand what it takes for California to succeed economically. So the results are what businesses, uh, the business community is looking for. And in this economy, you can't afford to go it alone. So we need to be building better relationships, partnerships rather, with our K-12 through community colleges and higher education institutions to communicate what is truly needed. So, and we do that through four different things. We do that through trying to work on infrastructure, workforce development, workforce housing, and economic development. 
So, but what is needed with education? Uh, with what's needed in education for the business community, the state needs improved education policies, programs that must be created to increase college, community college and university level attainment. We also need high levels of well-educated individuals to promote innovation across industries, facilitating the emergence of improved technologies. Uh, linked learning and project-based learning where students and instructors use in-depth and challenging classroom projects to learn valued problem solving and critical thinking skills. We need local control, which is crucial for supporting Latinos through high school graduation and on to university or technical training programs. And quite frankly, we need to cut the red tape on some of our local school districts, which is a huge priority. California has 6,000 standards, and we would be better just maybe having 600. One of the things we work on with the Latino community in terms of closing the gap is our Latino Educational Attainment Program here at OCBC. And we do that by empowering uh, Latino parents to take control of their child's education through, through, um, through the schools. One of the issues that we are finding, and it's something that Michelle was kind of talking about, was that our parents are out there, our Latino parents are working two and three jobs. They've got so many things going on. And you know, they've been intimidated by the system. And one of the things that we do at OCBC is we outreach to our parents to help them guide their children through the system. And that could be anything from ensuring that parents can go and talk to the principals and teachers, uh, finding out how they're doing in school, uh, what chemistry class is better than, you know, is this chemi chemistry class better than this other chemistry class, and basically involving themselves. And we've seen a huge in increase in GPA and um, grades uh, and grade levels uh, with the program. It's been really great. We've trained about 25,000 parents in Orange County. And what's been wonderful about this program is that the parents are now helping their students, their kids, to try and figure out what they want to do early on. Because we're finding that once, if, if kids aren't figuring out how to do things by the ninth grade, they're dropping out and we lose them. So helping identify those students early on in K through 6, even earlier in preschool if we could do it, um, would really help in trying to identify what they want to do later on and help hone in on those skills. So the good news is, is that we are doing better economically here in California, so 9.4%, but the lack, those lack of um, skills is what the business community is looking for. And one of the things, or rather what they're trying to, to, um, to eliminate. And one of the things we can do is just by having better communication with our K through 12 and our community colleges. Uh, the things we're working on with the Real Coalition, local control funding formula, we're really excited about the prospect and the debate uh, going on between the governor and the legislative branch. Online education, I think it could be a, po a huge opportunity, especially for folks who are working multiple jobs. Common Core implementation is going to be a big deal because I think it will help with um, getting those critical, skill, critical thinking and problem solving skills moving forward. And we're really excited. It's a little half-baked still, but <laughs> Senator Steinberg's SB 594, which would be the investment of business, um, business funding into K-12 through and community colleges. Um, to help develop those skills. And I know that can be a little scary for some folks um, about businesses kind of sticking their nose in it, but it's really just a matter of just business wanting to let educators know this is the type of, type of skills we need. We want to work with you on this because the overall goal is to have our folks live here, work here, and stay here in California and continue to add to California's economic success. Thank you, Alicia. That was mm -hmm. um, a great overview. I think that I think what we're all trying to connect the dots is between kind of the clear demand that exists in the business sector, the clear demand that exists amongst people trying to get out of poverty and trying to get those jobs, um, making exactly. sure that they're qualified to get them. So I appreciate you helping to frame that. Just earlier this week, I was listening to uh, the news on the radio and. They gave the latest, uh, you know, U.S. Department of Labor statistics, and shared that you know the unemployment rate is over 11 percent for those that have a high school diploma or less, but only 3.6 percent for those that have a bachelor's degree. So it just really kind of continues to reaffirm what we know: the better educated you are, the better off you're going to be in this economy. So, correct. Uh, thanks, Alicia, for for your uh, work. Uh, hope you'll stay for the Q&A, and thanks to the Real Coalition for 
putting the business uh, community front and center on these education conversations. Absolutely. Um, so Silvana, who's um, our conference call coordinator, is going to give instructions um, so that you can ask questions. We already do have one question. Um, as soon as she gives the instructions, um, we'll address that first question, but hopefully those of you on the line can, can join us in, um, in conversation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register for a question, please press the 1, followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1, followed by the 3. Please note when your line is open, please restate your name and organization. If you would like to ask a question via the chat feature, you may do so located in the lower left corner of your screen. Once again, to ask an audio question, it is the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. Thank you. And our first question is from Hans Johnson at the Public Policy Institute of California, and he's asking um, the following. Private for-profit colleges seem to enroll a disproportionately large share of working adults. Is this a concern, and if so, how should policy address it? Um, thanks, Hans, for joining us and for your easy questions. Uh, I'm joking. This is a really good one. Um, and I'll, I'll allow Judy and Alicia to chime in if they'd like. I just wanted to just share that I think um, you know, because there is this demand for better skills training, we do see that there's an increased number of working adults and, and adults of all sorts that are going on to for-profit colleges. I think what's good is the opportunity to access um, that kind of skill training. I think for-profit colleges have demonstrated some uh, real innovation and flexibility in terms of really meeting students where they are, offering courses at times and on dates when um, students can attend, providing really deep counseling and guidance, especially around financial aid. Um, but I think where policy is important is that we should demand quality outcomes. So uh, when students are investing their time and money, whether it's at an independent nonprofit college or a for-profit college or at a community college or Cal State or UC, we should expect that students will, um, if they put in the time and the energy and the work, that they should get a good opportunity, good shot at coming out with a degree or certificate. Um, I think on the bad side, we do see that the huge amount of debt that students are taking on sometimes at these for-profit colleges um, without a clear value in terms of a degree that helps them uh, prepare for meeting some of the demands by maybe AT&T or Boeing or some of the companies that require greater skills, and I think that's not acceptable. So I think state policy can play a role. Last year, state policy did play a role in terms of um, you know, narrowing uh, access and eligibility for Cal Grant aid to colleges that demonstrated better graduation rates and low um, loan default rates from their students, and I think that's certainly a good step in, in the right direction. Uh, Judy or Alicia, did you want to share your thoughts on that question? Uh, this is Alicia from OCBC. Um, actually, Michelle, you hit it on the head. I mean, OCBC and the Royal Coalition, we're all about having more options for students to complete their education. So if it's a for-profit and it's certified and the certificate is good or the degree is good for our local businesses, that, that's great. We're always open to, to options in terms of education. That includes charter schools and academies and, and different things that's going to help um, move uh, students forward in their education or to complete what they need to to get into the uh, workforce. Thanks, Alicia. We have another question from uh, Celia Garcia uh, about the Common Core standards. Realistically, how long before it can be implemented? And further, how long before it provides results for youth currently in K-12? Um, Alicia, you talked a little bit about um, how important K-12 alignment is. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Common Core, the first year is going to be a challenge. <laughs> so talking to our Orange County Department of Education, uh, it is going to be a challenge for at least the first year as um, teachers who are currently going through the testing process, uh, the STAR testing process uh, in our schools, uh, they're, as, as they're doing that, they're simultaneously trying to learn the new Common Core standards. So it's going to be a challenge, but at the same time, I'd say probably in the next three years um, it should be fully imp implemented and we should be raring to go and um, getting our students uh, through, the, through the new Common Core. So I, I, 
so even though it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting <laughs> as it goes along. I think this is going to be really good for our students um, as they complete K through 12. Thanks, Alicia. Um, and I, I think I would add that what is exciting on, from our perspective about the Common Core is that for the first time nationally, we're articulating um, clear skills that we expect students to graduate with to be better prepared for college and career. Um, I always tell folks that you know uh, not every high school sees it as their job to better you know to prepare students for college um, or for you know high you know demanding careers. Their job in many ways is to graduate them from high school, and make sure that they have the competencies to get a high school diploma. And I think to the extent that we can really push that demand around um, you know being college ready, that that will need to be supported by making sure that there's strong conversations happening between K-12 and our college leaders around ensuring that that becomes a reality. Um, we have yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So, oh, sorry, real quick. Yeah, go and ahead. With Common Core, I think it will really help hone in on those soft skills that we've been looking for in the business community, and that is our critical thinking and problem-solving skills. So I think this, you know, this is a very exciting thing for us. To, you know, to see and we look forward to the implementation. So we have a question from David uh, Gillanders. Um, are there any nonprofits you can point to that are helping to facilitate low-income parents to obtain tech skills needed for the kind of jobs mentioned? Um, I thought, Judy, you would be great to tackle it, and David is actually also interested in knowing if there's specific things in Orange County happening. So Alicia, maybe you can chime in as well. Sure. Uh, well, there are a number of uh, programs all over the state that are really helping to, to bridge this gap, and I would be happy to uh, put you in contact with some of those for in a particular area. I think that this is a place that uh, we need, uh, al always need additional investment. Um, I know that uh, particularly on the, uh, in the South Bay on the peninsula right now, there uh, are groups that are really working uh, with uh, Latinas and encouraging uh, their transition, their preparation for and then transition to post-secondary education. But David, I'm happy to have an offline conversation with you uh, specific to, to your location. And this is Alicia from OCBC. We have so many great nonprofits uh, in Orange County that deal with the, you know, with tech skills and, and STEM skills. And you'd be surprised um, about them that you wouldn't think that would you would. There are nonprofits out there you would think uh, wouldn't do this type of thing, and they do. I mean, Project Tomorrow um, is a great organization. They specifically deal with STEM uh, education, and they work a lot with low-income uh, students here in Orange County, especially with our changing demographic. Tiger Woods Foundation, uh, Girls Inc. is very big on STEM disciplines with their young women. Even the Boys and Girl Scouts are working on these types of things. And there's, there's again, I, hundreds of nonprofits that work on this type of thing uh, in terms of uh, technical skills. So, um, and uh, David, I would also be happy to talk to you offline about some more of those. Thank you, Judy and Alicia. I think we have a question uh, from Vivian Poe. A uh, verbal question, can our conference coordinator put her on the line? Certainly, Ms. Poe. Please go ahead and state your organization. Hi, this is uh, Vivian Poe with Near America Media. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Great, great, great. Um, so I'm very interested in um, uh, the, the parts where, um, Michelle, you mentioned about the financial aid access amount adult students, and I wonder if uh, if I can access any of the data about the, applic the applicant and the receiver of that uh, Cal Grant Competitive B program that you mentioned, because I'm very interested in the age and ethnic breakdown of, of, that, uh, of that program. Um, and also I want to ask, is there other statewide um, uh, grant or scholarship program that adult students can tap into? Thanks, Vivian, for joining us. Um, we can absolutely give you access to the data, one that's in our report, but also um, two most important resources, the California Student Aid Commission, Executive Director Diana Fuentes Michelle, I'm sure is, would be mm -hmm. happy to talk to you or their communication staff, so I can put you in contact with them to learn more about Cal Grant B in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Antiquis, the Institute for College Access and Success, which helped inform um, 
the kind of three case studies that we presented earlier on this webinar, um, they, they can certainly be available. So we'll, have, uh, we'll send you an email with their contact information. Um, I think it is important to note that there are some legislative efforts right now in Sacramento to expand the size of the Cal Grant B Award um, and hopefully expand the pool of Cal Grant B recipients given some of these challenges. Um, mm -hmm. There's legislation by Kevin DeLeon to create a tax fund, a voluntary tax fund that students, that, that you know, working Californians as they pay taxes would donate to um, and use those funds to help support an expansion in Cal Grant B, which hasn't been expanded in many, many years and, and in fact has been cut. Um, so I think there are some really positive developments. Of course, you know, those are all ideas and proposals, so I think seeing them through is going to be um, critical. Um, in terms of other grants, you know, we don't, we don't do kind of in-depth analysis of private scholarships or opportunities mm -hmm. that might exist that way. There certainly are many, but, but we do believe that, you know, the state of California and the federal government in terms of Pell and Cal grant aid are the biggest um, and most substantive providers of, of student financial aid. Um, in fact, most scholarships help to supplement the aid mm -hmm. they're already earning or getting from um, from the state and the federal government. Of course, the UC and the Cal State have a very big, um, significant pot of money also of institutional aid that they award to their students, so that's obviously um, helpful. Um, you know, they put about a third of, of the tuition and fees that they receive right back into uh, student aid. So I hope that Thank helps you so answer much. your question. Yeah, uh, just one more question about um, the efforts about expanding the size of Cal Grant B. Is there a, a bill already generated, or is just kind of still in the discussion period? There are bills um, generated, and um, off the top, I don't have the bill number. But Kim, mm -hmm. I think you're on the line, and maybe you can uh, share the two bill numbers for the Kevin DeLeon bills um, that are in place. And there are several others, Vivian, that we could um, share your way, um, you know, send your way so that you can be aware of some of the other, you know, proposals. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. And hi, Vivian. This is Kim. Hey. Just jumping quickly in. Uh, the two bills that uh, Michelle was referencing is by Senator De Leon that uh, addresses um, the Cal Grant B Access Award is SB 284 and mm -hmm. SB 285. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, and we have a question from Ronald Johnson. Uh, do we need to establish expanded literacy programs at the high school level to inform students about financial aid opportunities and college affordability? Um, and I would say a big resounding yes to that. You know, a few years ago the, the campaign sponsored and passed early commitment to college legislation that would voluntarily have school districts begin sharing with parents and students in middle school about their opportunities to go to college in California, what college in California look like, what's the difference between community colleges and a UC or a CSU and an independent college, um, and what financial aid might be available for students. We know that 112 uh, school districts are participating in early commitment to college, but it is voluntary. Uh, and there is legislation, uh, again, proposed by uh, Senator Lada that's been introduced this year. Uh, Kim Tran, our policy director, will have to chime in with the exact bill number. But the idea is to create a task force that would come up with um, a very clear structure for including this type of information into uh, the curriculum as students are, are learning. I think one thing that we recognize is that while supplemental supports are important, that it, if we really want every single California student to know about their options to go to college and about financial aid, if we can embed that in the curriculum, then we know that every student will get that. Um, so Kim, do you want to share um, the Senator Lada bill title and number? Sure. The uh, Senator Laura's bill is SB 524 that focuses on uh, curriculum development that, uh, for college and career readiness. Great. We have another question from Mario Garcieleta. Um, what is the state of California doing to align school curriculum to the jobs and skills needed in the future? Um, Alicia, do you want to tackle that one? I think that's you know something that's still a work in progress that we certainly hope the Common Core helps address. And we know that there's some really good bright spots and practices 
um, in local pockets um, like Long Beach and Fresno, where, there, where there's the Long Beach Promise mm -hmm. um, and efforts like that that really have strong collaboration between the K-12 school district, the community college, the universities, um, and the workforce in the region to help meet some of those goals. Um, but Alicia, you might have some other examples. Actually, no, that's exactly right, Michelle. Um, that with the Common Core, that's the goal is to help do is help with the alignment because it hasn't really been aligned up until now. So with the Common Core implementation, that's what they're hoping to do is you know get these soft skills, get more technic technical skills in place uh, to align with what business with the business community needs. Um, one of the other things that, um, and I kind of touched on a little bit earlier that we're doing, uh, is with, through academies. There is an academy, for example, in Orange County called High School Inc., and that is on the campus of Santa Ana Valley High School. And what they do is they have about six academies, and it ranges everything from healthcare to automotive to culinary. And you know it's kind of similar to maybe an ROP course, but it's in high school. And they specifically work with kids, students rather, they work with students that already, already know what they want to do. And they work on curriculum that aligns with what they're going to be doing in a future job. So having those academies ha has been a really good uh, thing to see because it, it will help align business with education and get those students into a job upon graduation, certificate, community college associate's degree, or higher ed. Yeah, this, the whole statewide effort around linked learning is really uh, getting to this piece, which is how do you engage students early on in uh, right. understanding the relevance of what they're learning in the classroom and how they can apply it um, once they graduate or, or what skills they'll need right, to go on to higher education um, to meet some right. of these skills and jobs in the future. So, you know, Senator Steinberg, um, again, is, is, has been leading the front along with um, the Link Learning Alliance um, statewide, which has been pushing for link learning um, curriculum at, at high schools across the state of California. Um, so we have time for one more question. Uh, Gail Williams, and I think she's available via audio as well. Please go ahead yes. and state your organization. Uh, my organization is Gail Williams Math Tutorial Service, and what I'm wondering is how to instruct. I know of a particular individual who just went back to school and is getting ready to uh, start the teaching credential program at 55 and has incurred a huge amount of debt getting from through the four-year curriculum and into that program. How would that person go about accessing funds to help allay some of this debt so that they can move forward? Gail, um, what I would share is that in terms of student debt, there's some national federal efforts around income-based repayment that um, the U.S. Department of Education with um, leadership by President Obama has put in place that ensure that students essentially pay as much as they can afford once they're working. Um, it's capped at about 10% so that no more than 10% of your salary um, is used for it. It's a, you know, it's a really good way to ensure that recent college grads um, have the opportunity to know that their debt can be manageable, but also if they go into public sector jobs that um, might be lower paying, um, that they can still pursue those, those passions and those careers and opportunities. I think that the challenge as I see it is that very few uh, folks know about income-based repayment. Um, and I think we have to do more in California to make sure that, that students know about their options for paying off their student la debt, not only when they graduate, but actually before they go to college, because it may be able to help inform whether they attend full time and whether or not, um, you know, one of the biggest sort of challenges for students to complete is that they're working and not going to school full time. So to the extent that they might decide to take on, you know, an affordable federal loan, attend full time, know that when they graduate they'll have an affordable repayment option, I think that's going to be critical. So hopefully that can help uh, those that you know, um, you know, attend college and, and, you know, get the education they need.
Um, so with that question, we're actually going to um, close out this webinar. I just want to kind of leave you all again with some of the things that you can do. Um, this webinar, along with um, the report, the full report, the executive summary, and the infographic that was previously on your screen, can all be found on our website, www.collegecampaign. Org. We totally encourage you to Facebook, tweet, um, share with your colleagues, and join us um, in engaging your legislators, your newspapers, your social media networks, um, and help promote, I think, what we think is important state policy to reverse these trends. Um, and with that, I really want to thank Judy and Alicia again for taking time out of their busy schedules. Um, and for all the hard work that they do to ensure that more Californians have a chance to go to college and, and graduate and get the kind of training that they need to meet our workforce demands. If you do use social media, um, please, use, please use the hashtag CAWorkingPoor um, to help promote this conversation online. And with that, thank you so much for joining the Campaign for College opportunity. We look forward to working with you as um, we continue to fight to ensure greater college opportunity for all students who want to attain it. Thank you and have a great day.